Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, everybody. I have a great story for you today. With me is Max Sherman. He is the author of Releasing the Butterfly, which is a very beautiful book. It is a love affair in four acts. So he talks about basically his entire love life with his wife, um, Jean Alice. And he's also a former Texas legislator. So he's going to actually answer a question that I've been dying to ask somebody and have not found the right person to ask. So thanks for joining me today, Max. Jennifer, thank you very much. I look forward to touching base with you and uh, you've got some beautiful colors behind you. So <laughs> you know how you know how to how to have a beautiful day to start. So let's just keep going. Sounds terrific. Well, it's a gorgeous day here in Northern California. It's supposed to be about 68 to 70 degrees, depending on which weather app you uh, believe. Um, and only a 50% chance of rain this coming Saturday, which in California is pretty iffy. We'll see if that actually <laughs> happens. So spring is definitely teasing us. So I'm going to enjoy it as much as I can. And um, fortunately for me, I love spring and I love it. I love it really warm. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it getting warmer and moving on with the year. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, um, about your, your wife, Jean Alice. It sounds like you guys had an incredible life together, a lot of experiences and ups and downs like we all have, but I get envious when I read about some of these, some of you people that seem to do so much. Well, it's, a, it's been a delight. I, I probably should start. Uh, uh, my wife is, uh, is, is a beautiful girl. She still is. And I still hold her foot and hold her big toe to make love. So we make love in a new way. So that's one of the things we've learned in this. But I probably should go back and tell you, first, we met accidentally in a county jail up in Texas in the Panhandle. And uh, she was only about 15 and I was about 17 or 18. And my church had a little church service every every Sunday afternoon there. And we had all guys, but we asked a group of quartet to come and, and, and sing for us. And they brought a young girl with the old military fold organ, and that was Jean Alice. So we literally met in the jail, and that started it. And we didn't date until we met in college. And we met at Baylor University, which was a Baptist school. We were Baptists then, and we since moved on to be Presbyterians. But uh, but we, I saw her, and I always said what our first caught her attention was her ankles, beautiful, gorgeous ankles, and she wore loafers with no socks. And so I'm president of student body at Baylor, and we put on a way to help students register for their classes. And all of a sudden, I looked over and saw this beautiful girl. That was the girl that I had first noticed in the jail. And I asked her if I could help her. And then I asked her to go have a Coke with me. And that was our first date. And then uh, she was only 17. So we've been together for 63 years. And uh, we fell in love. And we've covered a lot of journeys. And then uh, once we got into it, she's very independent. One of the most important things I think for me in the book is that our marriage was a partnership. And if you read the uh, blurb on the book from the president of the Ford Foundation, uh, where she talks about that partnership, and it was where we really handled our lives. We had two careers. We did things together. We did things separately. And even as we do deal with Alzheimer's now, we still do it pretty much the same way. And I recognize her independence. And with that, I do need to tell you that probably the most important chapter in releasing the butterfly is chapter 46, because it tells me the one place I'd started to violate that partnership. And that was when all of a sudden it dawned on me that I needed to go back to the full partnership and let her be her and let me be me and let us work through it together. But let me move to Alzheimer's because uh, when this all hit, uh, actually uh, 
we moved to Austin, Texas, where I was dean of the LBJ school. I'd been a Texas senator, and I'd been president of the university. And she ran the conference center at UT, which put together travel abroad programs and computer programs. And so she had a wonderful life, took people to England and France and Spain. And uh, so we both just kept doing our, our, our lives. But when we would entertain, after we had entertained a group of people, about five events in December of 2001, she said, you know, for the first time, I've not remembered all the names as easily and felt the pressure of it. And so our son-in-law was a vice president of the University of Texas in Dallas, and the Brain Health Center in Dallas was a part of that university. So he arranged for us to go to Dallas to the Brain Health Center in January of 2002. And we went up there for two days, and fortunately it gave us a baseline. And they spent two days, and John Hard at Southwestern Medical School is the physician for the Brain Health Center. And so we did all that, and then we saw Dr. Hart every year for the next 10 or 12 years before Alzheimer's descended on us. And but I, and then it gradually moved, and in, in maybe 2012, he said, you know, she should be worse, but she's not. And he said, she still looks at me in the eyes. She talks to me. She's impeccably dressed. She's beautiful. If you don't see any change, you don't need to come back next year. So we canceled that appointment. And then early in the next year, all hell broke loose. <laughs> and that was when we began to realize that we were dealing with something far more serious. Uh, in our church, she had, the organ in our church is dedicated to her. She is a pianist and an organ player and played the organ for 20 years in the church. And she was also an English professor. And, uh, but uh, we decided we better start making plans. So we moved to a senior living place and, uh, and with the possibility that if we needed memory care, it would be available. If something happened to me, she would have someone to take care of her. And uh, and then after we dedicated the brand new organ, it's dedicated to her and, and and did all that. That was in her in February, which was her birthday, was in the seventh of February. And then uh, in in April of that month is when the book starts. And that's when uh, I was rushing to the door. I had a fall, shattered a femur, had to go to the hospital for several weeks. And our kids had to make a decision for her to go to memory care. And so that's probably where I should start because for the next five years, this book was in the offing. It took five years in the going. And it originally was written as a play. and. It's a novel. It's not a play now, but it was a written as a five act play, <laughs> and it was written scene by scene. And the very first scene that was written, I was actually in hospice, and I was dying. My family was all around. This is all imaginary, and. Uh, and they're waiting for me to die because I thought we both had died. I thought our lives were over. And all of a sudden, I see a, a stage, a theater stage floating above my head. And it goes back to high school. And many of us in high school saw the play Our Town by Thornton Wilder. And the two main characters in that play are George and Emily. All of a sudden, I said, well, you know, this is really a play. So I couldn't talk about Max and Jean Alice. I had to talk about George and Emily. It had to be fiction. It had to be someone else. It could not be us. He couldn't reach into our gut and let us really feel that it, our lives were being shattered. And so I started writing, and it was written first as therapy for me. It wasn't written to be a book for anyone else. I was writing scene after scene, and I'd wake up at 3 in the morning, all alone in our apartment, trying to recover from a broken femur, and I would get up and go write something, whatever happened. So little by little by little by little, it captured what was happening day by day by day by day by day. And, and then when it got pretty far along, 
everybody that knew I was going through this, living in a senior citizen place, started asking me, how did you deal with it? How this, how that, what, what, what? And so I said, well, you need to put it into a book. And so I started trying to put it together in a meaningful way. And one of my good friends is Bill Moyers. Many people know Bill. He was around for years and and did a lot of many, many things. And I sent it to him, and he thought it was a story or, a, or maybe an article. And he woke up 6 o'clock one morning, and he said, oh, my goodness, it's a play, and I don't, I'm not a playwright. But he urged me to keep putting it together and trying to put it into a book. So that was the beginning. But it really was my therapy. And, and I, I wrote it little by little, day by day, and eventually it began to take on a form. And one of the most important things is that uh, in the relaunching of the book, which is happening as we speak, uh, it really is, um, how do I put this? It's a miracle to me. I guess it's a, it's really a miracle. There was a couple that I've never met, would not know, and did not know that live in Atlanta, Georgia, and somewhere they knew about the book and they read it and they said they wished that they had known about it because they one of the one of the members of that family had had they had two sisters that had dementia and Alzheimer's. And they said they didn't realize how important music was. Well if you look at releasing the butterfly from chapter forty three on you're going to pick up an awful lot of, of, of music. And all of a sudden, we, and even now, music is very important to us. She still listens to Consperari, and they're an Emmy Award-winning group, and, and she was on their board. And there's a paragraph in there from the director, Craig Hella Johnson, and because his father had dementia. And, of course, what we begin to realize is that almost everyone that we know, either a parent or grandparent, a grand grandparent has been touched by dementia or Alzheimer's. That it is a pervasive disease. It's yep. going to get worse. It's not going to get better. And we realize that an awful lot of caregivers just get crushed, and as I was crushed. And I, one word you'll see over and over in there is it's lonely. I was lonely. I picked up something in the <laughs> chapters with the music that I wish I'd picked up while my mom was still living. My mom's been gone for four years. My mom played the organ, nothing like Jean Ellis. She played it for fun. And when I tried to use music with my mom, I never found the music that she connected to. And when I read your book, I was like, I should have tried some of the music that she used to play on the organ when my sister and I were kids. Oh, well, better luck next time. <laughs> That's what I love about talking to people yeah. still. I'm still learning so many great things about caregiving and best practices and i feel like after 300 plus conversations like this one if i'm still learning good stuff then my listeners are going to be learning good stuff um so i want to go back to chapter 46 when you said you were violating your partnership can you explain i i know exactly where i can remember the lines even which is well i did read it two days ago so <laughs> Um, but what, what was it that you were doing that she finally bit, pretty much verbally put her foot down and told, told you you weren't in charge? Well, I've got my copy in my hand, and I'm mainly because I wanted it. I think it's important to start the way it does. It said the volcano that simmered deep within Gene Alice's mind erupted one morning in, of all places, the elevator of Westminster, which is our senior living. We were heading out to her weekly Pilates session to join her five friends. I made the breakfast, laid out her work clothes, nudged her. Let's be on time. I held her hand as we hurried in the elevator. She was smiling. Oh, don't worry, she said. They won't start without me. At the elevator reaching the garage floor where our Volkswagen was parked, she backed away to the far side of the elevator, crouched with her shoulders hunched back, looked me straight in the eye, and exploded. I'm not going to that place again. I'm certainly, I'm certain she did not know where that place was, just as she had no idea where the club or the school were when she lost her way to go there an earlier time. Her powerfully ingrained instinct 
was for her to decide whether to go or not to go somewhere. I was out of line to think that I was in charge. She had always jealously guarded her right to be in charge of decisions affecting her. That was the key to her identity. I had failed to appreciate the fact that on that morning, alone in the elevator with Jeannie, I now realized that to her, I was a drill sergeant, incessantly barking orders, get in line, you're out of step, hurry up, you're late, do this, do that. It wasn't just about leaving the house and being on time for appointments. I was making all the decisions. I chose the TV shows to watch. I chose the food we ate. I chose the clothes she wore. I did the driving. I read the map and determined the route, something she had always done. I selected the paragraphs from the newspapers for us to read together, and then I read it to her. I suggested it was time to take the dog for a walk. I urged her to play the piano, and my ultimate insult was to say, let's be on time. (laughs) Inside her, the genie I had always known was shouting, I am genie. Don't treat me like a thing. I am genie. I am a strong, confident woman. And this is what was so important for me personally. I was stealing Jeannie from Jeannie, nibble by nibble, in the midst of the storm. I forgot that I was her partner and not her parent. Instead of making every decision for her, I should have asked her what she wanted. Would she prefer chocolate or strawberry ice cream? What do you want to watch tonight, a comedy or a spy story? Would we we sing hymns or songs from musicals? Are you about ready to go to bed? Most of the time she would say, oh, you decide. But I had missed the headline. She wanted to be asked. No, she needed to be asked. She wanted to be treated like she was someone, like Jeannie. And now she had to defend herself or think totally losing her autonomy. And all of this is obvious to me now, but in the moment, I was furious. I exploded with my own profusion of pent-up frustration for the morning. Don't ever say that again. We're going to keep exercising, working puzzles, reading books, seeing movies, doing everything possible to stay alive as long as we are alive. I didn't realize it then, but I was grieving, just as all caregivers mourn the lives they once had and the persons that their loved ones had been before Alzheimer's marked them indelibly. And then the last line of that paragraph, I wanted my genie back. That line spoke to me a lot. My mom had Alzheimer's for 20 plus years, starting when I was in my, well, the first signs started showing up when I was in my early 30s. So I really did not have my mom. Like my daughter's, most of my daughter's life, my daughter is 32, she'll be 33 at the end of this year, which for those those of you that like to listen to the back catalog, this is 2024. So, and I still miss my, my mom. I don't miss the Alzheimer's mom. I miss the person that she was supposed to be. And sometimes I still get mad that she didn't get to do the things she wanted to do. But you you make a really good point is a lot of caregivers, you know, we take over, we're, we're trying to control what we can control, we're trying to do the best we can, we're doing too much. And it's hard to know when we're doing too much, I think. People are learning. Yeah, I think, I think so many of us have are been fixers up. We fix it. We take care of it. If it, if you have a pipe that broke, you repair it. And so all of a sudden, it's, it's, it, that was why that was such an important chapter to me. It was when I first realized this was something I could not fix. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, I, I had to realize I kept trying to fix it. I kept trying to fix it. I kept trying to fix it. And I think that's why. It's so hard, you know, I've always said, and I now tell my kids if, if I'm ever in this position, number one for the caregiver, 
is be sure to take care of the caregiver first. Because if the caregiver is not able to be fully engaged, then you can't take care of the person who needs the care. And so number one is take care of yourself. And I think that's a difficult person to listen because we we want to empathize. Mm-hmm. We want to reach out and take over and do it. And, and yet, uh, I think it's, it's I, I keep telling my friends, uh, find some way to go off and just meditate or do yoga or go get drunk or whatever <laughs> it is you, you need to do, you know, but get some way to get off to yourself and realize that, that life is going on, even if you're not there. And my wife has a wonderful person that's with her different times named Monique, and she's an angel. And she is in many ways more important to her now than I am. And I understand that. And I say, you know, that because she's there and she helps her take a bath and she helps her do things that need to be done. So it's a, it's hell on wheels, but I think if you can just uh, begin to realize that you move through it and day by day, and so we're not quite as many years as you were with your mom, but you know we're we're now into nine years, maybe ten, and uh, we meet, uh, we get together, and, and and she if her head's on one side, she's sleeping; if it's down like this, she's paying attention, <laughs> and I'll say. I, I th- could I get a kiss? And if, if the head's straight down, well, she pops that head up and looks over and her way of giving me a kiss is <laughs> chopping, her, chopping, chopping her. No. So we've learned how to give kisses in a different way and, and find that to be another way. And I meet with friends and they'll say, well, how were, how was Gina? I said, yeah, we were out making whoopee today, <laughs> you know, so, so, so we continue to make whoopee, and I think that's been extremely important to our lives. I've talked to caregivers who I actually have a past guest who married her husband after his diagnosis of Parkinson's. And one of the ways they managed his disease and the caregiving that is necessary is they talked about her fears, what she pictured his fears, how he wanted to be cared for. So they had a partnership going forward for caregiving. So they kind of charted a course for how to live with Parkinson's. I think you figured out how to chart a course for living with Alzheimer's based on your, the previous years of your relationship might be the best term. And you're probably a good spokesperson for caring for the caregiver first since you had that unfortunate fall and broke your femur, that must, that must, that gives me pain thinking about it. <laughs> it gave me one hell of a lot of pain. I'm Jeez. sure it did. <laughs> the only bone it's I've had, ever broken is my collarbone when I went flying off my bicycle. That part well, wasn't, it wasn't too. It wasn't just broken; it shattered it. So I've got all metal in the in that leg now. You know, so it's uh, it's it's it it sends off the alarms in an airport. Oh. I don't set off alarms, but occasionally it'll let me know the weather's going to change. That's really annoying because I have a metal plate on my collarbone, too. So you and I have something in common. Um, One of the things that struck me kind of painfully mentally, actually, is when um, your kids made the decision to move her to memory care. They advised you to stay away, which I understand is not uncommon. I did not get that with my mom. Um, They said she would acclimate. It took a little longer than they said. And the first six weeks of her in memory care were pure hell. Um, Because when she saw me or my daughter, she cried and wailed and carried on like a prisoner being released. It was very intense. And I've told the story about how I showed up one day and she was following another resident who was bound and determined to use the telephone. (laughs) And my mom said, oh, Come with me. I have to help my friend. And even to this day, the word friend, when she said it, you they could have said, you've won the jumbo lottery. Here's a bag of diamonds. How many golden retriever puppies do you want? When she said friend, it was the best thing I'd ever heard my entire life. So looking back, do you think that that advice to stay away was good, bad? I know you didn't like it. No, I think it was absolutely indispensable advice in my case. I'm not sure everyone would 
fall into the same category. But I'm a lawyer by training. I'm a good lawyer, and I've given a lot of advice. And so many times people that haven't followed it, then they get into real trouble, and then I make a lot of money in getting them out of <laughs> a mess that, that I tried to keep them from getting in. So because of that background, when the professional said, don't see her, and 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 I, I didn't see her for four months. Oh, that kills me. A long time. But I worked, I worked it out. I called her every morning at 10 and every evening at 6. And over and over on the phone, she would say, well, you know, I've got my clothes picked. Uh, you could come pick me up. I should be with you. And we had, a, but if I had been there and I would say there may be three or four people that I know of that moved someone in and had the experience you did. And the, and the loved one who had Alzheimer's or dementia was protesting so desperately they moved them out and then they couldn't get back in because they had made them, but the protest is going to be there. And uh, soon after she moved down there, one of the helpers here came up to see me on a Sunday afternoon. He said she had sat to talk with me, and she looked down in there with three people in wheelchairs, and they had their heads down, and she says, I don't want my family to see me like this. And she was very alert, very smart. And, and he had to come and tell me about that. But she said, I don't want them. I don't want to be here for that. So her instinct was that it was not the place for her. And uh, so we would talk every morning and almost always she would say, you need to pick me up. You need to come get me. I need to be with you. But as we move through it, when I finally get a call from the people, the caregivers and people in charge, and they say, we think you ought to come and visit her in the morning. Now, don't come at mealtime. Don't come at other times you're together. Don't come on Sundays because she'll want to be with you. And then don't don't plan to stay too long. And then we'll see how it works. And after it works, okay, we can extend it. And so when you read those chapters from 43 on, you're going to pick up a little bit of that. We started having meals together. We got more time together. And we built the life that we have now, we built after we went through the hell of being apart for four months. And uh, and so for, in my case, it was just unbelievably important not to have to go through every home, come back from having the kind of sprint you did. Who's my friend? Why aren't you here? You should get me. And there's a story in there by a friend of mine who is, a, he was a judge and when he knew I was in the hospital with a shattered femur, he came to see, talked about his mother who had Alzheimer's and he tells about picking her up and how they protested her father, his father put in a deal to keep her from going out the front door because she took off all of her clothes and went out in, in the rain, walked through the neighborhood so, he, so she couldn't leave. And then another time he came in from his shop in the back and she had all of her clothes in the, in the car. She said, I'm ready to go home. And even though she was home and been there for years, and then my friend, the judge, told the story that one day he came over, and they were going to take her out to eat, and she's in the back seat, my, my, the judge is, my hot father driving. And she says, well, we can't leave without Daddy. And the father, like most of us, fixers up and explained, you know, it's very logical. But you know, your your father's been dead 30 years. <laughs> no, 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 we cannot leave without Daddy. If Daddy's not ready, we've got to wait for him. She just kept insisting we've got to wait for Daddy. And finally, my friend, the judge in the back seat says, Mama, I just talked to Papa, and he doesn't want to go. Problem solved. Yep. It wasn't. To, it wasn't tried to explain to her. It was to acknowledge that she was that. And, and I had that experience with Jeannie, and they're recorded in the book of a couple of times we're having meals, and she wants to talk about her mother and her grandmother, and you have that very same thing. So those in those little incidents along the way, and then all of a sudden, what's good starts turning not to be so good. And all of a sudden, you move to a plateau, a high plateau, and then it starts getting eroded. And then you, and and this would not be true, Jennifer, of all of the people that look at your work, because uh, one of the things that just created hell for us was uh, COVID. Mm -hmm. Because 
my wife was walking. She would walk up and down the halls, taking care of people, checking on them, what they were doing. I would pick them up in a car and we would go out to have restaurant meals and have a breakfast here and a lunch there. And when COVID hit, under the law, everybody was locked down. And so all of a sudden, but that she's now in a wheelchair and she's in a wheelchair because if you don't use your leg, if you don't use them, you lose them. And so it, I hope none of your people who follow your work ever have to go through COVID again because it, it just literally shattered what was working in a good way. We were having some good times and good experiences. And then when you go for a few months and you never see each other. So we had four months at the beginning. We had six months with COVID where we could not see each other. And then, and that just every thing goes into the tank. Yeah, COVID didn't help. I really hope we've learned some things. I really wish we'd learned more about being a community and taking care of each other. Maybe, hopefully this doesn't happen again. <laughs> Not in my lifetime no. anyway. Um, but hopefully we've internalized some things, even though there's a lot of, there's a lot of negative feelings about how it was handled. Um, my theory is, we didn't know what was going on and people made the judgments that they made at the time. And it's very easy to go backwards and go, oh, yeah, well, you know, like keeping the kids out of school seemed logical at the time. Now we know that was a really bad choice. So we, we got to yeah. learn from things and move forward, which you've done. Um, but yeah, my mom died March 31st, 2020. So I got to miss 99 percent of the covid nightmare with her. I got to live through it myself, but it was I didn't have to worry about trying to do a Zoom call with her or face, t you know, window visits or any of that stuff. Um, I don't think it would have worked very well with her. Um, but it's interesting to go back to the previous question. My mom never asked to go home. I was always surprised about that. Um, once she acclimated, it was like she'd not lived in my childhood home. They bought it in 1970 and she moved out in 2017. So what is that, 47 years? So that's a long time to live in the same house. And she seemed to have totally forgotten about it. And she, she managed just fine. But those first six weeks were just, they were awful. And I'm wondering now, listening to your response, if I did myself and mom a favor, um, because when my mom moved to memory care, I was just 50. I'd just turned 50 the previous fall. And she, I was still running my other business. I was a professional portrait photographer. And so it only really fit into my schedule to visit with her once a week. And in the beginning, I'd spend like two and a half, three hours. Like I gave it my all, which I've learned now was also not the best solution. But I'm wondering now if <laughs> by only going once a week, it helped her acclimate a little bit faster. Like if I had gone every day or every other day, she might never have acclimated now that I'm listening to what and listening to your response and what you've written in the book is very interesting because I've seen some advice on social media is like, no, don't don't put your loved one in a place that recommends that, which I was kind of on board with. But you you've given me a new perspective to think about. So I'm hoping that helps the listeners think about it differently as well. So <clears throat> could, could I could I take this current situation to your other question mm -hmm. you asked me to think about, mm -hmm. and that is that in regard to the health care issue, you know, with my background in politics, my own judgment is that there is no short term answer for that one. Mm -hmm. I don't think that in order that, and I've, I've really, I, I thank you very much for suggesting it that I think about it, because in the current situation, COVID was a current situation. We had to deal with it. It was what it was. We weren't prepared, and we didn't really, we just st stumbled through it. <laughs> and in many ways, the health care issue is very much the same. In my judgment, having given it a lot of thought, is that probably the best way we're going to do anything is to use a current situation, which is the Affordable Care Act that is now na nationwide. It's called Obamacare in some situations, and it's not as broad as it should be. But the broader it gets and the more people we cover and the more people, younger people, begin to have health care at an earlier time, they won't need 
care for dementia and Alzheimer's and other illnesses, and it builds up in overtime. And they're also going to begin to learn things from picking up that. So what I guess I'm hoping that somewhere we get smart, intelligent Democrats and Republicans that come together and say, we just ought to expand and add to Obamacare, affordable health care, do it nationwide so it's not one state against another. It's not one community against another. If you live in a small town in Nebraska or a small town in Montana or Idaho, or you live in the big city of New York City or San Francisco like you do, if you live in any of those places, you could find someone that could help you to do something because it reaches into the small communities as well as the large. So I guess I think the political answer is to take, because if you start from scratch, it may be 50 years before we ever get there. But now you've got something to work with. So I think it can be done incrementally to keep adding to, to cover more and more people and then begin to take what you learn from that. And of course, the premise of insurance is if you spread it over a broad base, then you can use, for example, uh, one of the things in in Affordable Care Act is that pre-existing conditions are now covered. For years, they were not. Mm -hmm. We're now learning how you do that. So I'm hoping we might do the same with dementia and Alzheimer's. That makes sense. So just to clarify my question to Max, because like I said, he's a former legislator, is what does he feel our government, both federal, state, and maybe even local, can do to help support caregivers? Because, and I've said this a lot on the show, until big corporations realize that this crisis of caregiving and the epidemic of Alzheimer's and dementia causing diseases is already affecting their bottom line, nothing's going to change. And I don't know why I didn't think about starting with the health care, because if we get people healthier at a younger age, not only are they better able to help drive our economic engine, but maybe they won't get some of these chronic diseases that we're dealing with now. This is why I love having these conversations, because like, Duh, I do all of those brain healthy things. Eat right, exercise, get my sunshine, keep my stress under control. If they suggest it, I try it, except eating fish. I don't like fish. <laughs> um, so, but if somebody said, Jen, guarantee you won't get Alzheimer's if you eat salmon twice a week, I would do it. I would hate it, but I would do it. <laughs> so I'm really surprised I didn't think of that. Um, I was thinking more along the lines of like tax breaks or some sort of incentive. So we know that caregivers on average spend about $850 a month out of their own pocket, which is, you know, it's not a small amount of money. It adds up, you know, 850 this month might not be a big deal, but every month, you know, that's, that starts to hurt. Um, but I like your answer. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just, it, you know, politics is, is incremental anyway. And and <clears throat> I have a book on Barbara Jordan now because Barbara was a dear friend. And we really both believe that uh, somewhere in the middle, the parties that are on the far left and far right come together, and it's in the middle that you begin. To, and that's a little bit what the Affordable Care Act gives us. It's a start. And it's not, you don't start from scratch. But you really you have a you're 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 a hundred million people into starting, and if you can move it to two hundred million, uh, what a blessing it would be. Yeah, I totally agree with that. You guys can like you know email me. That's in the show notes. You just click the little hot link at the bottom. Let me know what you think because I'm really curious. Because this, like I said, this is a conversation I've wanted to have for a long time. I've had a particular politician in mind because she's also a caregiver but because she's currently in office no matter how she answers it's going to be political and i don't think that that would be something they'd be interested in so i've never asked and as my mom always said everything happens for a reason so i didn't ask her so i could ask you what is um like the one piece of advice you would want to leave the caregiver listeners today that you've learned through learning how to live with Alzheimer's, because I really feel like that's what you've been doing. I think we all need to learn how to learn, learn to live with these diseases until we get what your solution is. 
I think the uh, it's a little bit distilled out of that piece that I read from the book, but I do think that is Jennifer. I love you. <laughs> I will always love you. You are you, whether you are where you sit now, or whether you have your head bowed, or whether you're asleep, or whether you have your head over here, whether you acknowledge that I'm talking to you or not, I love you. And I think that I'm sure that my wife, Jean Alice, understands it because I say it over and over and over and over. Jeannie, I love you. I'll always love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Catch a kiss. Catch a kiss. And I think and then I will just maybe finish because I mentioned that story when the guy came to talk to me and I don't, she said, I don't want to be like those three women. One of them, I had never seen her raise her head. And we had a little Shih Tzu dog. And I would take the dog down to the apartment and never once saw that woman raise her head. And we, I got Jean Alice to go down and play the piano in the activity room. And I'm sitting there because I'm not sure if I should have the dog there. And this woman sitting next to me in that wheelchair. And all of a sudden, she's petting my dog. So I think we make assumptions about what's going on. And there's, that many times there are false assumptions. You think that person's not in how she knew that dog was there, I have no idea. And, and over and over, I think it's to acknowledge the uniqueness of that person who is dementia and Alzheimer's. They're still unique. That's still a unique person and treat them like my wife, Jeannie, says, I am Jeannie. And that's the most important thing for me is for me to always remember she is Jeannie. Yep, I agree with that. My mom always thought I was her best friend, so it was hard for me to put the two things I like. This is my mom, but I always acted like her best friend because that's how she thought of me. So this is one of those learning things where it's like I I always acknowledged her as her own unique person, but sometimes I wish I'd remembered more that she was mom. I just went with the whole friend thing. And I too took one of my golden retrievers to visit once and that was that was absolutely beautiful that all of the residents absolutely loved him one gal was so attached to him that she got very angry with me that i had a um, pinch collar on her dog <laughs> and i thought uh oh we better go visit some other people before i lose my dog to this gal and he loved it he he just was willing to let all of them love on him and you kind of got to see a different side of them when you brought in a new a new entity, a new soul. So I like that with remember that they're a unique person because it gets hard. You know, when yeah. you have to make a lot of the choices and a lot of the decisions and, you know, like you said, you're lonely because they're not the same person. It's really tough. Yeah, very tough. Well, it's like I said, I hadn't quite finished the book. I got about 15 pages left. Crazy computer scooped up some of my time over the weekend. <laughs> but it's nice to know she's still with us for now and that you guys managed to muscle through COVID like most of us. And I wanted to tell people uh, releasing the butterfly is a beautiful story. It's not just about Alzheimer's or how to be a better caregiver. It's kind of just how to be a really good person. And I know you guys are going to enjoy it, so please check it out. Max read to you chapter 46, and I think you can appreciate how nice that was, and you'll enjoy the whole book. Thank you very much, and glad to get to know you. Thank you, you too. Sounds like you guys have had a, a very full life, despite or with Alzheimer's, however you want to think about that one, and you give me some motivation to, to, to live as well. Let's go keep swinging and singing and dancing. There's Sounds even like a, a good... section in the, in the book about dancing, so it, it's also something that we could have danced all night, so let's keep doing it. I agree. Well, thank you so much for joining me, and thank you guys for all tuning in, listening to Max, and I will talk to you again next week. 
Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.